Welcome to the Radical Truth Podcast. I am your host, Glenn Meldrum, and this podcast is brought to you by In His Presence Ministries. Visit us on the web at www.ihpministry.com. We started studying in our last lesson, chapter 12 of Dr. Luke's Gospel. The setting for this chapter comes out of Jesus' confrontation with some religious Jews, where he seriously rebuked them while having lunch at a Pharisee's house. My guess is that Jesus took a couple of the apostles with him to witness the event, and when he returned to his disciples, it was important for him to help them understand what this event was all about. A large crowd was gathering while Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's home. When he finally returned to his disciples, the first thing he began doing was teaching them some important truths from this event. In the first three verses from chapter 12, Jesus was warning the disciples about the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and experts in the Mosaic Law. The twofold reason for this was to help them understand how manipulative self-righteous people act and to protect them from backsliding, which could turn them into Pharisees. To help them with this issue, Jesus brought to their attention the fact that everyone will be judged by God, and what is done in secret is fully known to God and will be revealed to others. Though Jesus spoke this in relation to the hypocrisy of the religious Jews, it also relates to the rewards the Lord will give to his faithful followers. Jesus certainly speaking to his disciples through verse 12, and then we see some interaction that comes from the crowd. It's not obvious when Jesus left off teaching the disciples and began preaching to the crowd, but by verse 13 the change is clearly evident. Like I said a moment ago, the first three verses are about the hypocrisy of the religious Jews. What follows is some powerful and important teaching on counting the cost of true discipleship. The time of Christ's sacrifice was drawing near. His teaching of the apostles and disciples had always been very purposeful, beginning from the truths of the kingdom of God and moving on to how they were to live after his death, resurrection, and ascension into heaven. Though they didn't understand this, its value would be known at the proper time. To help prepare the disciples for what was sure to come, Jesus said in verse 4, I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, and after that can do no more. The Lord is dealing with one of the realities that we will face as humans. He's not giving us some mystical teaching, but addressing what was sure to happen in the lives of his disciples. We weren't created to be hermits living separated from others. God created us to live in community. This was a fact revealed in the Old Testament in how God was developing a community of faith, which was a nation of Israel, but they failed to live out God's will in this matter. In the New Testament, the community of faith is a true church, where each member is a part of Christ's own body, where he is the head that leads and guides those who own him as Lord. The first thing we need to see is that Jesus calls them friends. All those who belong to the world are his enemies, for their lives are hostile to him and his kingdom. Before people gain true salvation, they are enemies of God. Salvation, according to the word of God, happens when people flee from the darkness of this world into the glorious light of Jesus Christ and the salvation he freely gives to repentant sinners. In Luke chapter 7, verse 34, Jesus responded to the religious Jews' accusation that he was a friend of sinners. Then in verse 35, he said, But wisdom is justified or proved right by all her children. It was the Pharisees that said Jesus was a friend of sinners, not what Jesus said himself or what the Word teaches. Jesus was friendly towards sinners in an effort to lead them to salvation where they could become true friends of God. Jesus was the greatest missionary there ever was or ever could be. He sought out the lost, longing for their salvation and deliverance from their bondage to sin. He was and is the perfect example of compassion, which every follower of Jesus should be striving to emulate. Genuine followers of Jesus should never make worldly people their close friends and confidants, especially since the Word clearly forbids us to have such an unequally yoked relationship. It's right and necessary for Christians to be friendly and loving towards the unsaved, yet it must be through a missionary's heart. True disciples are forbidden to be friends with the world, and if they become friends with the world, then they become an enemy of God. We must approach the unsaved with a missionary's heart that's filled with love for their eternal souls. When we cross the line from being missionaries to the lost and become their friends, then we are either in the process of backsliding or have crossed from life to death. The Pharisees weren't friends of those they considered sinners. The motive for this was thoroughly selfish and unbiblical. They weren't faithful to God and His Word or free from worldliness. They were absolute failures at rescuing those who were practicing sin and separated from God. 
True followers of Jesus must be separated from the world in heart, mind, and spirit, while at the same time striving to win the unsaved through the compassion of Christ. This distinction is extremely important, and we must seek to understand it and live it out, so that we don't become worldly or pharisaical. By becoming friends of Christ, we have entered into an authentic relationship with Him. This isn't make-believe or a figment of our imagination or some kind of self-delusion, but a real relationship that's able to be experienced. As people grow in this relationship with Jesus, they are sure to grow in love and devotion to Him. This is the point that needs to be understood in verse 4, where Jesus told us to not be afraid of those who kill the body, and after that can do no more. We have within us a natural drive for self-preservation, and that's not a bad thing in many circumstances. As it relates to our faith, love, and testimony, it has real potential to be disastrous, carrying with it temporal and eternal consequences. The only way we can overcome this negative dimension of self-preservation is for us to have a better love than our love of self. This was a common theme Jesus preached on, and we see this in Luke chapter 9, verse 24, where he declares, For whoever will save his life shall lose it, but whoever shall lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. This same thought is repeated in chapter 17, verse 33. This isn't about striving to save your life and family if your house is on fire, which would be the right thing to do. This is seeking to protect yourself from suffering for Christ, which is an integral part of proclaiming the gospel to a perishing world. Jesus is addressing what happens when persecution comes against the church, and if we seek to preserve our life from the cost of discipleship, then we can't be a disciple or friend of Jesus. We are commanded to not be afraid of those who can only kill the body, but are powerless to touch the real life of people, which is their eternal soul. Though Jesus is specifically talking about persecution, I think it can relate to many situations we are in as he deals with in the following verses. The Apostle John shared in his Gospel something similar to what Dr. Luke wrote, but the Lord also presented a different idea in both verses. In John chapter 12, verse 25, the Apostle recorded Jesus saying, The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. The hatred of self that Jesus is talking about isn't some kind of morbid self-hatred or self-depreciation, but is all about hating our sinful nature that needs to be crucified at all costs. If we won't live the crucified life, then we are surely seeking to preserve our life in a way that's contrary to what Jesus is teaching. How will we lay down our life for Jesus if we don't love Him enough to stand against those who verbally assault us? If we are controlled by the fear of man, then we will be afraid of their ridicule and endeavor to secure their good opinion of us. This will cause us to lose Christ's good opinion, which is of the greatest importance and of eternal value. Jesus brought clarity to this thought by stating in verse 5, But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after killing the body, has power to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Jesus makes it clear that God has the power over life and death and over the eternal destination of every person. If we fail to understand this, then we will either not have the fear of God or will only have a fear of death that causes people to seek to save their life rather than relinquishing it to Christ. Jesus boldly tells us that we should fear God, and this is good Bible from cover to cover. King Solomon taught this in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge but fools despise wisdom and discipline. In Mary's song of praise that happened after Elizabeth gave her a prophetic greeting, she pronounced in Luke chapter 1, verse 50, His mercy extends to those who fear Him, from generation to generation. This teaches us that mercy is freely given to those who fear the Lord, and the implied conclusion is that He withholds mercy from those who don't fear Him. That's very scary. Jesus had shown himself to be the most loving person this world has ever known or ever will know. It was out of love that Jesus gave them the warning that they must fear God and not man. People try to do away with the fear of God or turn it into mere reverence, rather than understanding that Jesus is the most dangerous being that there ever was or ever could be. In the cheap grace, wimpy love of God teaching that's overtaken the church at large, there's no room for the fear of God. We see from verses like Psalms 103, verse 11, how love and the fear of God go hand in hand. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is His love for those who fear Him. Scripture has a tremendous amount to say on the fear of God, and rightly so, because without it we are sure to practice sin. Moses told the people in Exodus chapter 20, verse 20, Do not be afraid, 
God has come to test you, so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. Without the fear of God, we won't have this good and positive influence that can help us flee from sin and its consequences. It is right and necessary to fear God, since He not only has the power and right to kill our physical bodies, but possesses the sole right and power to cast us into hell. People can only kill the body. They don't have the power or right to cast people into hell. The eternal punishment of hell is infinitely worse than the death of our body. To understand this, we must have sound biblical knowledge concerning eternity and the faith to believe what the Lord said on this all-important subject. If we believe that we are no better than dogs that die, whose only life is in this world, then there's no advantage to suffer the rejection of this world or to stop the practice of sin. But if we are eternal creatures, which we are, who had a beginning and will live forever, then what happens to us after the death of our body is of paramount importance. The condition in which we die will determine our eternal destiny. If we die in the practice of sin, then we will die throughout eternity by being left alone by God, and this is a hell worse than anything human language can describe. But if we die to our sinful nature through divine grace, then we will be with Jesus forever, seeing the wonder and beauty of who He is and enjoying what He will give to those who endure to the end by loving Him supremely. It's a travesty that the preaching of the fear of God has been virtually abandoned by the church. The results of this is seen in the compromise that is spread throughout vast portions of the American church. The fear of God is a truth that's essential to living right with God, and when this message is abandoned, it will surely breed compromise and contempt for God in those that claim to be Christian. The next truth Jesus gave his followers is found in verse 6. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Sparrows were used for food by the poor. They are small birds with little meat that was sold at a very cheap price. Matthew's account of Jesus teaching this principle has him saying that two sparrows were worth a penny, and Luke states that you could buy five for two pennies. I guess it was buy four, get one free. Jesus mentioned the extremely small denomination of money these birds cost and the little value that was placed upon them to show how much value the Lord puts on his followers. Matthew added Jesus saying in chapter 10, verse 31, So don't be afraid, you are worth more than many sparrows. Here is the providence of God that's demonstrated in how he takes care of the sparrows and knows when each one dies. His foreknowledge doesn't mean that these birds were determined by God's sovereign will to die in a sparrow soup but that the Lord is mindful of every creature no matter how small and insignificant they may seem to us. Nobody, and this means absolutely nobody, knows how God's sovereignty works along with mankind's free will, which He gave to them according to His sovereign will. The import of what Jesus is teaching has to do with bringing comfort to His disciples over the fact that the Lord knows them intimately and what they need before they even ask. The Lord knows all those who suffer for the cause of Christ, he cares for them through their suffering until they are either delivered from what caused their suffering or are delivered through death. Jesus went on to say in verse 7, Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Since the number of the hairs on our head are constantly changing, the Lord must be constantly watching over us. There's nothing we go through that He doesn't see or care about. He's mindful of our condition and needs in real time, and we can take comfort that He's watching over us for our eternal good. How many times have we felt alone, abandoned, or neglected by God? Yet our feelings didn't line up with the truth of who God is as He has revealed Himself in Scripture. Jesus promised to never leave us, not because we have intrinsic value in ourselves, but because the Lord chose to set His affection on us. It's the nature of God to care for all of His creation, and as an all-knowing, ever-present God, He knows absolutely everything about everything, and that includes us. For those who walk with Jesus, this should be a wonderful comfort because there's nothing we go through that He doesn't see and care about. Yet for those who don't know Him or are backslidden, comprehending that God knows them in absolute terms should be terrifying. I imagine that as Jesus was teaching this to the disciples, when he came to the point that they are worth more than many sparrows, that he had a big grin on his face and a twinkle in his eye. Jesus didn't become human to rescue sparrows, and he didn't die on the cross so that their sins could be forgiven, since sparrows don't sin or have a sin nature. The Lord thought that we were of great enough value to redeem us by becoming our atoning sacrifice. 
Jesus told us not to be afraid because he knows us and everything that concerns us. Being afraid is an expression of unbelief. It's being filled with fear and apprehension and certainly isn't the same as the fear of God. When we fear, we are not made perfect in God's love because being afraid is evidence of our lack of love and trust in his character. In verse 8, Jesus said, I tell you, whoever acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man will also acknowledge him before the angels of God. We see in this verse that Jesus pressing home the point that he made earlier in verse 4 where he said, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. The promise to every disciple is that if we will be faithful to him, then he will be faithful to us. If we will unashamedly tell others about the wonder of God's love, then he will acknowledge our adoption before the host of heaven. Jesus wants us to understand that he rewards those who are faithful to him by proclaiming his name even in hostile situations. Our acknowledging Jesus before sinners isn't just for their benefit, but it's integral to ours as well. I have seen what happens when people are ashamed to let others know they are Christian. They will have a hard time standing against the temptation and influence of those they were cowering before. It's good and healthy to boldly and lovingly stand up for Christ before a world that's bent on rushing to hell. The other day while I was preparing for some meetings where I would be preaching, the old hymn, Rescue the Perishing, came to mind so I looked up the lyrics online. I had been crying out for the Lord to save the lost through our ministry, and as I read the lyrics, I began to weep. I want to read to you this precious song that was written by Fanny Crosby in 1869. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. Weep o'er the erring one, lift up the fallen, tell them of Jesus, the mighty to save. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, Jesus is merciful. Jesus will save. Though they are slighting him, still he is waiting, waiting the penitent child to receive. Plead with them earnestly, plead with them gently. He will forgive if they will only believe. Down in the human heart, crushed by the tempter, feelings lie buried that grace can restore. Touched by a loving heart, wakened by kindness, cores that were broken will vibrate once more. Rescue the perishing, duty demands it, Strength for thy labor the Lord will provide. Back to the narrow way, patiently win them. Tell the poor wandering a Savior has died. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. What a wonderful hymn. This addresses our great need to tell others about Jesus and to not be ashamed of him before a watching world. They desperately need us to be Christ's ambassadors to them, though they may not even understand this fact. In verse 9, Jesus declares the negative side of this, saying, But he who disowns me before men will be disowned before the angels of God. To confess or deny Christ is about what we do before others. Whatever that may be, the Lord will in kind repay before the Heavenly Father and holy angels. At the root of denying God is a self-love that produces a destructive form of self-preservation. This is contrary to what it means to be a follower of Jesus, who should boldly proclaim what great things the Lord has done for us. To live out the life of a follower of Jesus includes speaking God's truth and love to people who don't know Him. If we are ashamed of Jesus before people, it's because we love ourselves more than Him and more than the people we are refusing to present Him to. Jesus promised that if we are ashamed of Him, that He will be ashamed of us before the Father and the host of heaven. When a little boy loves his daddy, he'll fight anyone that says anything bad against him. For the boy to be apathetic when people are speaking lies about his father reveals that either he's a coward or doesn't really love his father. How can we say that we love Jesus and not be disturbed by all the people that's constantly blaspheming his name and mocking him? Of course, we aren't to respond with anger and violence, but we should through love strive to show them the truth of who he is. Well, my little boy analogy has many limitations and loopholes, but I hope you understand what I'm striving to communicate. Since it's not God's will for us to beat people up that have slandered His name, we should as adoring children want everyone to know about our great big daddy God who loves us and will save any that come to Him. To be ashamed of Jesus is evidence that people don't love Him or love Him like they should. Self-love produces in people a drive for self-preservation, which is when people seek to save their life from the discomfort of ridicule, the embarrassment of being known as a Christian, or the danger of telling others about Christ. 
Jesus warned Peter about this very issue, how he would deny that night three times that he knew the Lord. The problem with Peter was a heart issue, a love issue, yet he couldn't see the truth of what Jesus prophesied over him until it was too late. In the Gospel accounts of Peter's denial, we see a man that was overwhelmed with his cowardice and pride that left him filled with guilt and bitterness of soul. Since Peter wanted to walk with Jesus, there was hope of reconciliation, which happened after Christ's resurrection. The Lord used this event to show the man his sinful nature and desperate need for dependency upon divine grace. There is forgiveness for those who deny Christ, but there must be authentic repentance that brings a change of life and not mere sentimental notions that change nothing. Those who are living right and doing right according to God's will have no need to be ashamed of being a follower of Jesus. The world has gone crazy. Well, it's been like that for a long time, actually. The world and the host of hell tempt the saints to be ashamed of serving Jesus, where there should be no shame in this at all. While those who should be filled with shame for their wicked life are often applauded for the evil they practice. May we have the boldness to stand up for Christ and His good and noble cause to win perishing immortal souls to the Savior. Now we come to a troublesome verse that has caused a lot of good people confusion and scholars much debate. Verse 10 reads, And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. I want to begin by stating a few obvious points. First, Jesus reveals the divinity of the Holy Spirit by elevating the Spirit's position above Himself. Another point is that everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. This doesn't mean that people are automatically forgiven if they blaspheme Jesus or speak against Him, but that the potential is there if they will repent. We can also say that it's clear what Jesus said about people who blaspheme the Holy Spirit, that they will not be forgiven. This isn't a new idea where people cross a line in the practice of sin and the Lord declares that He will not forgive them. I recently mentioned in one of the lessons the story of King Manasseh and how the Lord said he would never forgive all the blood that he shed in Jerusalem. For some reason, we have come to believe that the Lord must forgive our sin if we ask Him, but that's not what the Word teaches. The Lord isn't obligated to forgive us, but He does so because He is merciful and slow to anger, and as a result, we can trust what He said about repentance and forgiveness. People can't repent unless the Lord gives them the opportunity and this is what Jesus taught in John chapter 6, verse 44. No man can come to me except the Father, which has sent me, draws him. Those who blaspheme the Holy Spirit will never again experience the Lord drawing them to salvation. Some commentators made the claim that the unforgivable sin could only be committed during the life of Christ. But there's no scriptural evidence for this. Over all my years of ministry, I have come across many people that thought they had blasphemed the Holy Spirit, believing that the Lord wouldn't forgive them, so they felt utterly hopeless. I told each of them that they wouldn't be under conviction or be drawn to the Lord if they had committed the unforgivable sin. To sin so grievously against God means that people would never feel the Spirit's tugging at their heart, and they would only grow harder and more hateful against Him. I don't think this is a common sin people commit. Yet the fact that Jesus mentioned it shows that it does happen. The challenge with the verse centers upon what it means for a person to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. The dictionary definition for blaspheme is to speak impiously or irreverently of God or sacred things. It is to speak evil of God and slander Him. This definition is rather broad, for it could include what many genuine followers of Jesus said before coming to salvation, which reveals that they didn't blaspheme the Holy Spirit. The Greek definition of the word Jesus used is similar to the dictionary definition. To blaspheme is to vilify, defame, revile, or speak evil against. Jesus said that if people vilified him, that they could be forgiven. But if they sinned in that way against the Holy Spirit, that they would never be forgiven, which means that they would never make heaven their home. To help us understand what this sin is, we need to look at the other accounts where Jesus said this. The account in Matthew is found in chapter 12, beginning in verse 22, where Jesus cast a demon out of a man that had caused him to be blind and mute. The response of the Pharisees was to say that Jesus cast demons out through the power of Satan. Then in verses 31 and 32, Jesus said, So I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. 
Jesus repeated himself on both points, that those who blaspheme against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, and that those who blaspheme Jesus could be forgiven. The severity of blaspheming the Holy Spirit is seen in the point that they will not be forgiven either in this age or in the age to come. Jesus said that he will forgive every sin and blasphemy against him to help people understand that it's his heart and desire to forgive people. It appears that the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is a very rare and aggravated form of sin. Mark chapter 3, verses 28 through 30 sheds more light on the subject. I tell you the truth, all the sins and blasphemies of men will be forgiven them. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. He is guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying, He has an evil spirit. Jesus said that to blaspheme the Holy Spirit is an eternal sin, and it has to do with the Pharisees saying that Jesus was demon-possessed and performing miracles through demonic power. Here is the crux of the matter. The blasphemy of the Holy Spirit happens when people see the power of the Spirit manifested through verifiable signs such as healings and casting out demons, and then accredit the power to demons. The first stage of the sin begins with people seeing the power of the Holy Spirit manifested through signs and wonders. Then through malicious intent for the purposes of swaying people away from Christ, they discredit the miracles by saying they were done through Satan. Some claim that this can only happen to backsliders, since it would take a person that truly knew the power of the Holy Spirit before they could accredit the power to demons. The unforgivable sin can't be committed by those who have never known the power of God. It happens only to those who have known the power of God and are so hardened in their backslidden condition that they maliciously slander the Holy Spirit. Dear listener, if you think you have committed the unforgivable sin, then take comfort. You wouldn't be listening to this podcast if you did. Don't let the devil beat you up over such a blatant lie. The people Jesus was immediately referring to were the religious Jews that wanted to kill Jesus. They had seen enough of his miracles to know that they were legitimate and heard his teaching to know that they were pure truth. Yet they attacked the Savior and strove to keep people out of the kingdom of God by discrediting the true Messiah. Thank you for listening to The Radical Truth with your host, Glenn Meldrum. We at In His Presence Ministries pray that this weekly podcast will be a blessing to you. Please tell others about it and subscribe yourself to this free podcast. Don't forget to visit our website at www.ihpministry.com. See you again next time, and may God richly bless you as you seek Him in spirit and in truth. And thirst no more, so come wash in the river, come drink your fill. Let healing waters bear away your gain. Oh, come wash in the rain.